Immediate effects. Check out this review on beef organs and Firestarter from Jamie C. Firestarter plus beef organs and an animal-based diet of steaks, burgers, beef tallow, eggs, butter, cheese, raw honey, mangoes, and berries helped me lose eight pounds in two weeks while gaining more muscle mass. I sleep better at night, perform better at work, study better in grad school, lift better at the gym. I feel less anxious, less depressed, less stressed, less bloated and inflamed, less aches, less stomach problems, but more motivated and more satiated after meals. I removed all other supplements too. This is the best supplement improvement. Uh, this is the best improvement in two weeks I've ever experienced. That's what we're about, guys. An animal-based diet of organs, meat, fruit, honey, and raw dairy. I believe it's the most evolutionarily consistent diet for humans. If you get those organs fresh, amazing. If you can't or won't get them fresh, that's what we're here for at Heart and Soil. Get organs in your life. Beef organs is heart, liver, kidney, spleen, and pancreas. Firestarter is our high stearic acid tallow from suet. You can find both of them at heartandsoil.co. The goal is to help you reclaim your birthright to optimal radical health heartandsoil.co. Desiccated organs are amazing. Grass-fed, grass-finished organs from New Zealand. The highest quality in glass. We never use plastic. The capsules are gelatin, no fillers. This is the real deal, guys. And these organs are powerful. Look at the reviews on our website. People are benefiting so massively from getting organs back in their diet. And it makes me feel so good. Heartandsoil.co.co. Claim your birthright to radical health. On this week's podcast, I wanted to answer one of your questions. Do I eat fish, chicken, and pork? And the answer is no. So this podcast goes deep. It's a deep dive into why I don't eat fish, chicken, and pork. I'll talk about fish with PFASs, pyrofluoroalkylated substances, polyfluoroalkylated substances, heavy metals, and microplastics. And I'll talk about accumulation of linoleic acid because chicken and pigs are monogastric animals. And you will, I believe, learn a lot. So this is why I do not eat chicken, pigs, pork, or fish at this point in my life. I know those foods can be a good variety, but I feel like they are too toxic today. So here is your answer for why I don't eat fish, chicken, and pork. And I think you will learn, especially about the PFAs, was a fascinating rabbit hole. The negative effects they can have on especially male and female hormones are quite striking. On to the podcast. Do you value your hormones, your testosterone? Even your estrogen for both men and women should be at the proper level. What about progesterone? Okay, if you value proper levels of your hormones, if you're a man or a woman, then this podcast is for you. And in this podcast, I will tell you why I do not eat fish, chicken, or pork because I value my hormones and I want them to be optimal. I wanna start with this paper, which should get all of your attention. If you are looking on YouTube, you will see this paper on the screen. If you are listening, I will read you the title and you can find the abstract or the paper online. It is from the Journal of Toxicology and Applied Pharmacology. It is from 2012 and the title was enough to stop me dead in my tracks and get me reading it. Fluorochemicals used in food packaging inhibit male sex hormone synthesis. That is a scary title. That is clickbait, but it, you know, it's a, article, so it's not really clickbait, it actually has some substance behind it, unlike most of what's in the news today. But these polyfluoroalkyl substances, they also call them perfluoroalkyl substances, or as the abstract says, polyfluoroalkyl phosphate surfactants, PAPs, widely used in food contact materials. And I'm going to show you which food contact materials they are used in in a moment of paper and board. So paper coated with plastic, cardboard coated with plastic, like you found in every Whole Foods that you put your salad in at Whole Foods. Why are you eating a salad? Maybe that you put your uh, teriyaki chicken in at Whole Foods that may have seed oils in it as well. These substances, polyfluoroalkyl substances, perfluoroalkyl substances, have recently been detected in over 57% of investigated materials. Human exposure occurs as PAPs have been measured in the blood. We also know these compounds pass through the placenta and they pass through the blood milk into babies. Not a good thing. So in this study, they used a cell culture model to elucidate the effects of six fluorochemicals on sex hormone synthesis and androgen receptor activation in vitro. That is in a test tube because it's in cell culture. And I won't read the names of all these, but there are many four PAPs and two metabolites uh, abbreviated by PFOA and FTOH. Also, you may see the abbreviation PFAS. So the conclusion here was striking. They say that overall, these results demonstrate that the fluorochemicals, 
present in food packaging materials and their metabolites can affect steroidogenesis through decreased BZRP, which is benzodiazepine receptor protein and increased CYP19 gene expression, leading to lower androgen, that is testosterone and testosterone derivatives like DHEA, DHT, et cetera, and higher estrogen levels. Now, if you are a man, that hits you right in the gonads. If you're a woman, that hits you right in the gonads too, because for both men and women, it is critically important to have optimal levels of testosterone and estrogen. If women have levels of testosterone that are too low, then they will not have appropriate sex drive. If men have levels of testosterone that are too low, well, then we also don't have enough sex drive, erectile dysfunction, all kinds of problems, muscle mass, all kinds of issues. Men are very familiar with the effects of low testosterone. But this paper was scary and it got my attention. Um, basically, they put these chemicals into cell culture and they look to see, these are pictures of the chemicals. Uh, they look to see what happened. And as you can see, the steroidogenesis and the, um, the formation of the androgens was inhibited. They also note here, as I said, that the uh, fetuses and infants may be exposed through placental passing and or breastfeeding, as I said. But this is a striking paper. You guys can look at it, but it got me thinking about these substances what are these chemicals? Where do we find them? And are they a big deal for humans? So you may be asking yourself now, Paul, you said this was a podcast about fish, chicken, and pork and why you don't eat those things. Well, I'm going to fast forward for a moment and then I will rewind. Guess what? Fish, shellfish are a huge source of perfluoroalkyl substances. PFAS are present in a lot of fish and shellfish. That is just one reason that I don't eat fish. I will get to the others in a moment. But before I do that, I want to continue unpacking PFAS because they are much more pervasive than I thought, and it's a very scary thing. I think that increasingly in 2022, it is very difficult to maintain proper hormonal health as a male or a female. So this is an article from Environmental Health Perspectives. The title is PFAS, Perfluoroalkyl Substances in Food Packaging, a Hot, Greasy Exposure. Sounds like the title of a bad 80s movie. Um, they say in the first line, first there was EDT, then came BB, BPA. The latest chemical acronym to become a household name is PFAS, short for per or poly or and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Now, this is a big problem. They have a picture of a popcorn bag here. If any of you guys are eating popcorn out of the microwave, stop. Just freaking stop. Why are you doing that? Okay. Uh, I'm going to be empathetic, but you're crazy. Stop doing that. But as you'll see in this article, they are present in a lot of fish and they are present in many other containers that we may eat food in. And in fact, when I looked at this picture, this is a title of a paper, PFAS and Alternatives in Food Packaging Paper and Paperboard Report on the Commercial Availability and Current Uses. Just look at this photo. You have coffee cups here from Starbucks, right? Those are lined with PFAS. You have takeout containers. You have cardboard boxes here, like you may find at Whole Foods or any store that you're taking uh, takeout from. All of these containers, especially your plastic coffee cup, is lined with plastic to make it water resistant, waterproof, and those have PFAS. Your coffee cup in the morning that you are getting from Starbucks or your coffee shop of choice is of negatively affecting your hormones. You're welcome. Maybe I should sing it like uh, the character in Moana. You're welcome. So this is from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. The authorized uses of PFAS in food contact applications, nonstick cookware. Yet another reason that I do not use nonstick cookware. I would never use Teflon, any nonstick, and I'm skeptical of all of it, okay? I use stainless steel, Mostly I use a grill, which is entirely stainless steel at my house. Uh, but if I'm going to cook on a pan, I'll either use cast iron or stainless steel. Gaskets, O-rings, other parts in food processing equipment. PFAS may be used as a resin in forming certain parts and used in food processing equipment. You better know if anything you have has exposure to these. PFAS, PFAS may be used as processing aids for manufacturing other food, contact polymers to reduce buildup or manufacturing equipment, and paper Paperboard for food packaging, PFAS, PFAS, PFAS may be used as grease proofing agents in fast food wrappers. Why are you eating fast food? Microwave popcorn bags, take out paperboard containers and cups that you get from Starbucks and pet food packaging bags. Yet another thing that's brown with your pet food. We're working on a 
much better pet food. Stay tuned for that to prevent oil and grease from the foods leaking through the packaging. This is the FDA saying, oh, this is all fine with us. This is what actually happens right now. Well, no big deal, you're saying. I don't use any of those things, to which I would say, really? You don't use any of those things? Okay. What about dental floss? Do you use dental floss? Is it glide floss? Because here's from Harvard TH Jan, who I generally detest because they are so funded by vegan interests, but nevertheless, we will cite them here. Some dental floss exposure may be harmful to people. These are PFAS chemicals. The study found that women who flossed with oral B glide floss had higher levels of a chemical called perfluorohexane sulfonic acid. This is PFHXS. Then in their blood, than women who didn't use that type of floss. PFHXS is a part of a large class of chemicals called PFASs, which are found in many consumer packaging goods ranging from nonstick cookware, why are you doing it? Go throw it out right now and send me a video to waterproof clothing, which you're hopefully not eating, but it still could be contacting you to food packaging. Uh, they're also used in firefighting foams at airports and military bases. So if you're exposed to that, if you know someone, if you're a firefighter, if you work at an airport, if you're exposed to those things, you probably have PFAS exposure. If you're in the military, you could have PFAS exposure. These chemicals have been linked to liver damage, harm to the immune system, developmental issues, cancer, and they can persist in people's bodies and in the environment for many years. Damn it. Research found that several types of dental floss contained fluorine, which indicates the presence of PFAS compounds. It's just one of these things where you say, shit, God damn it. <laughs> so um, you can find the study linked in that uh, article on TH Chan. And here is something from the Silent Spring Institute, dental floss and other behaviors linked with higher levels of PFAS in the body. Same study referencing it here um, that these flosses are a problem. So look at your dental floss. Is it oral bleed glide floss? Does it have PFASs? Why are you using plastic floss in general? I did some research on this last night because I was looking at my floss and I'm thinking, okay, there are silk flosses, there are bamboo flosses. If you choose to use dental floss, which I think is reasonable, I do. I don't brush with toothpaste though. You guys know that. Uh, but if you choose to use floss, why not use something that is silk or bamboo? Okay, Paul, I don't use any of those things. I'm not exposed to PFASs. Well, do you drink sparkling water? <laughs> Some sparkling water brands may contain high levels of risky chemicals called PFAS. And a report found, this is a Consumer Reports article, these include Tobo Chico, which I think has reduced it, but still contains PFAS, Polar, Bubbly, B-U-B-L-Y, and La Croix, La Croix. So I've done it. I've stood in Whole Foods and I've told you La Croix is bullshit. It contains PFAS. There's evidence linking some PFASs to health issues like high cholesterol, cancer, thyroid issues, immune system problems, low infant birth weights, and completely destroying your hormones. You, I'm obviously being hyperbolic, but messing up your hormones. PFASs are not federally regulated, but some states have set limits. All the brands tested were compliant with current standards. But do you really want to be drinking bubbly water with PFASs in it? I don't. We have enough insults to our hormones in 2022 that I don't want any more. There are many things I can't avoid. I drive a car. That car contains fire, flame retardant substances in the seats. I cannot avoid that. But I'm going to control every single thing that I can avoid so that I preserve my overall health and hormonal health as long as possible. This is not being fearful. This is being empowered. I believe that knowledge is power. I don't do these things because I'm afraid of things. I do these things because I want to live as well as possible. And I believe that the more intention with which we live our lives, the healthier and the higher quality lives we will lead. If you do what everyone else does, if you swim with the fish with the current, guess what? You end up like all the other fish metaphorically. Well, most of the other fish are obese, unhealthy, and riddled with autoimmune disease or chronic illness, depression, erectile dysfunction, basic unhappiness in life. I don't want to end up like that. That's why I intentionally try and question these things and share this information with you guys, which is kind of a fun thing. So a few more things on PFASs before I get into fish, chicken, and pork. But say you don't do any of those things. You don't use dental floss with PFAS. You don't use the glide floss. You don't drink any of those bubbly waters. You don't do anything that touches those plastic lined containers. You don't have boxes from Whole Foods that you're putting your takeout from Whole Foods and why are you getting Whole Foods takeout in the first place? Most of it's full of seed oils. I've talked about this on my social media many times. You don't get any of those cups from Starbucks. You either don't drink coffee 
to which I would say high five, or you get, you bring your own mug to Starbucks because you're just a diehard. Well, either of those is better than using the Starbucks cups. You don't get tea in those cups. You don't get water in those cups. Okay. You don't drink water. Like I said, sparkling water, LaCroix, bubbly, polar, Tabo Chico. You don't do any of those things. Do you eat fish? <laughs> because fish also contains PFASs. And that is yet another reason that I do not eat it. So look at this article. Our floral alkyl substances and fish consumption. Emerging classic contaminants. They're regulated or voluntarily limited due to concern about environmental persistence. Yet another problem with them and adverse health effects. We've seen this already on the other articles that are referenced, including thyroid disease and dyslipidemia. The major source of PFAS exposure, I'm reading uh, from the abstract now of this paper, which is from Environmental Research 2017. The major source of PFAS exposure in the general population is thought to be consumption of seafood. In this analysis, we examine PFAS levels and their determinants, as well as associations between PFAS levels, self-reported fish and selfish consumption. What do they find? PFAS are emerging contaminants with widespread exposure, persistence, potential for adverse health effects in the general population, fish and shellfish consumption are associated with PFAS levels. So again, this is observational epidemiology, but people who eat more fish have higher levels of PFAS in their blood. Is it possible that people who eat more fish are using more of that glide floss? Yes, but these type of correlations generate reasonably strong hypotheses that I would say are pretty hard to explain away in other ways, which makes them a good fodder for actual interventional studies. Certain specific fish and shellfish types were also associated with specific PFAS. Adjustment for additional variables resulted in little to no change in effect estimates for seafood variables. Pretty compelling evidence that we fish, which we know contains these things, is the source for most people of PFAS. Now you see there are tons of acronyms here if you're watching YouTube. 7 PFAS, PFDA, PFOA, PFOS, PFHXS, MPAH, PFNA, PFUA. Okay, whatever. Right? You get the idea. <laughs> Lots of PFAS in fish and shellfish. Don't do it. Why would you do it? So, shifting global exposures to poly and perfluoroalkyl substances evident in a longitudinal birth cohort from a seafood consuming population. As you can see in this paper from children in the Faroe Islands, is apparently how you pronounce it, levels of PFAS have been declining, but this is a seafood consuming population. And you can see that they still have high levels of PFAS uh, compounds, but they have been declining as these compounds have been removed from generally the food chain. However, they are environmentally persistent and persistent in the body. So you'll see, they say, However, changes in exposure sources are not well understood. Here we report serum concentrations of 19 PFASs measured in children between 1993 and 2012 from the North Atlantic Fishing Village community, the Faroe Islands. And rapid declines in legacy poly and perfluoroalkyl alkyl substances have been reported in human populations. But they're still in all of those things I mentioned earlier. So you can see these are in seafood. This is a big deal. This should not be ignored yet another reason that I do not eat seafood. So this is the first reason that I do not eat seafood. And we can segue into that part of the conversation, which is the main focus of this podcast. The idea that I do not eat fish, I do not eat chicken, and I do not eat pork. I do not eat those things individually for different reasons. But as I was researching fish and these PFASs, I thought, oh, this is very fascinating. Yet another reason for me to not eat fish. This wasn't even on the list when I started my compilation, the outline for this podcast of why I don't eat fish, but it suddenly became the thing that I wanted to lead the podcast with because I thought it was so important and so seldom talked about. So I don't eat fish because of PFAS. I also don't use any of those plastic containers. I don't drink coffee in general, but I definitely don't put any hot liquids into those cups. I don't get any takeout from Whole Foods. I know what my food touches. I don't use nonstick pans. I don't get any of those sparkling waters. I definitely don't drink anything in plastic and even in my own home, I am trying to remove all plastic as much as possible. The meat that I get here in Costa Rica is pretty good. There's a grass-fed company here called Grass-Fed Costa Rica. They're based out of San Jose. They do regenerative stuff. They send meat in plastic. So I said to the guys from Grass-Fed, will you send my meat? They deliver it to my house every week in glass. So what I did this week is I went to a grocery store and I got borosilicate glass containers. I got seven 
two liter containers. So I can get 24 to 26 pounds plus of meat every week. And I can put it in glass. I think this is going to be a huge, interesting thing for me to experiment with. I wish I had previously measured my PFAS levels. I don't have those sophisticated metrics, but I can see if my testosterone or other hormones will respond to this. The last time I measured my testosterone was about a year and a half ago. It was 740. And so we'll see. There are lots of interventions I'm doing now that could affect my testosterone either, either positively or negatively. Obviously, I'm trying to do as many things as I can to affect it positively, but I'll let you guys know when I get my blood work in a few weeks, heading back stateside to do some collaborations, and I will share that on the podcast as well. Nevertheless, I'm trying to eliminate all sources of plastics from my food exposure. So that is what I'm doing with regard to PFASs and plastics for other substances as well. We know that BPA is a problem, but also BPS, BPE. Just because something's BPA-free doesn't mean there are no bisphenols, no other xenoestrogens in the plastic. It's really hard in 2022 to have healthy hormones as a man or a woman. Hopefully this helps. Knowledge is power. This is not being fearful. This is being empowered by understanding where your exposures are coming from. So none of those things in my life try and minimize PFASs. If I can find an assay for PFAS, it would be interesting to test this. I'm sure there's a company out there, maybe Great Plains or one of these companies does perfluoroalkyl substances. Reason number two that I don't eat fish is heavy metals. Most of you are probably aware of the problem with heavy metal contamination in fish. This is a review from May in 2017, an overview, an overview of the adverse effects of heavy metal contamination in fish. And you're welcome to read the review. Basically, since fish are consumed by large mass of population due to their high protein and polyunsaturated fat, fat content, human health is also under danger is their last sentence of this abstract, all these parameters are significantly affected by heavy metals and hence proved as useful tools in biomonitoring or toxicity studies. They say it has been observed that to monitor the health indicator of the organism fish, a battery of bioassays or biomarkers is required in addition to this rationale. Using the few selected parameters, such as condition indices, bioaccumulation, blood chemistry, marker enzymes, of tissue damage, oxidative stress, genotoxicity, histopathology, uh, the aquatic pollution with heavy metals has been emphasized. So basically the metals we see in fish are things like uh, iron, manganese, uh, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, chromium. Also, we see things like lead, mercury, arsenic, and cadmium in fish. It's basically the equivalent of eating a cow that is grown in downtown Tokyo, in my opinion. Would I eat a cow grown in downtown Tokyo? No, because the cow is constantly inhaling bad air. Well, unfortunately, we've polluted the oceans. So most fish is going to have problems with this. In fact, all fish will, including the benthic fish, even the fish on the bottom of the ocean, even small fish. There are many examples of well-known people having pretty significant mercury and heavy metal poisoning after they thought that being a pescatarian was the smartest thing to do for their health. Tony Robbins is an example. He had massively elevated mercury levels used Quicksilver scientific products to remove the mercury levels. That's neither here nor there. Joe Rogan has talked about elevated levels of arsenic in his blood from eating sardines, which are presumed to be low in the heavy metals because they're so small. But I have seen personally from my clients using wild salmon just a few times a week, it will elevate their mercury levels in the blood. What about something like opa or, or tuna or mahi or swordfish? The mercury levels go through the roof. There's a lot of people that still eat tuna. There's a lot of people that still eat swordfish and mahi and opa and bigger fish, these are full of heavy metals, notwithstanding the fact that they are full of PFASs. I just don't think fish are an intelligent choice for humans today. They're full of too many toxins. Do they have defense chemicals? No. Unless you're a pufferfish liver, as you remember from the episode of The Simpsons that made that famous in my mind, at least, which does have some, I believe it's tetrodotoxin. I'll pull up the Wikipedia page because it's pretty entertaining. Fugu, which is the name for pufferfish, served as sashimi or chirinabe. Liver was served as a traditional dish named fugu kimo, being widely thought to be a tasty part, but it is also the most poisonous to trototoxin, as I mentioned. And serving this organ in restaurants was banned in Japan in 1984. Fugu has become one of the most celebrated dishes in Japanese culture because of that. Well, we know that things that are banned are often appreciated, but the point of that is to say that there are some animals, very few that have defense chemicals. 
most all plants do. In fact, I would argue that every single plant has defense chemicals or it doesn't really exist well as a plant. Perhaps there are some plants, leaves, stems, roots of plants that have less chemicals because they have physical defenses like spikes or barbs, et cetera. But most, I would say every single plant has plant defense chemicals and you can find them if you look hard enough, but very, very few animals do. So the point here is that fish in general does not have defense chemicals unless you're a puffer fish or you're fugu, as it were. And in general, they would be great for humans. And I think throughout our evolution, they have served as valuable for fuel for humans. But we have polluted the oceans too much and the bioaccumulation of heavy metals is just too much to bear, uh, I believe. So that is reason number two, that I do not eat fish. Reason number three, that I do not eat fish goes back to microplastics. Let me show one more study on heavy metals before I move to that. Heavy metals in commercial fish and seafood products and risk assessment in adult populations in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So you can see these two fish species should be consumed in moderation, especially by pregnant women. They're talking about tuna and mackerel, while consumption of various fish and seafood on average is not of significant concern. Health risk could not be ruled out for high consumers. Look, they're talking about cadmium, mercury, lead. What I would say is why would you knowingly, purposefully, consciously put those chemicals into your body, you know they're bad for you. Why would you purposefully smoke cigarettes? I don't know, good question. Heavy metals in marine fish and meat. Consumer health, a review, yet another one. They're saying that in South Africa, there is significant exposure to these. Um, the toxicity of these metals may be dependent on their chemical forms, et cetera, but there's no question that there are heavy metals throughout the population of fish all over the world Bosnia, Herzegovina, the Faroe Islands, South America, South Africa, et cetera. So heavy metals in fish, in my opinion, are just, they're not worth, the juice is not worth the squeeze. Yeah, there's too many toxins in them and you will end up with heavy metal toxicity. You will end up being less than optimal as a human. I know you have questions about fish. I'll get to you, I'll answer your questions about fish right after this. I wanna talk about microplastics. So this is the, Yet another reason that I do not eat fish and their compatriot seafood shellfish. So this is a great review from Nature, which is a pretty well-respected journal. Microplastics are everywhere, but are they harmful? I'll let you guys read the review. Basically, there have been very few studies in humans. Here's a chart of different types of microplastics. Here is another chart of different microplastics. But as they say here, and I will show you these studies, there are multiple studies in mice showing that five micrometers uh, could stay in the intestine and reach the liver, and they have negative effects in animal models. Probably could also happen in human models, I would say. Then in placentas, they did find microplastics in placentas, suggesting that, of course, humans are exposed. Could it pass to the baby? Perhaps. So it's not clear whether there was contamination in the placentas, but that's a scary thing as well. Further on, you can see that basically there is just scary amount of information about microplastics in animal models. Let's look at this one study here. I'll show you. Polystyrene microplastics induced male reproductive toxicity in mice. So yeah, go ahead, eat your fish, stack your PFASs and the polystyrene microplastics and the heavy metals. And uh, you're lucky if your testicles work, my friends. So, I mean, the title really says it all. Polystyrene microplastics induced male reproductive toxicity in mice. Scary stuff. You can see here, polystyrene microplastics induced testicular inflammation. Disruption of the blood testes barrier. A study demonstrated that polystyrene microplastics induced male reproductive dysfunction in mice provides new insight into the toxicity of microplastics in mammals. Uh, I don't want this in my body. How do I limit microplastics as much as humanly possible? We'll get to that in a moment. And then another study in mice that I will show you, poly polyethylene microplastics affect the distribution of gut microbiota and inflammation in mice. So here we have polyethylene microplastics messing with your gut flora. That's a negative thing too. So you can see here in the abstract, feeding groups showed a significant increase in staph abundance alongside a significant decrease in parabacteroides abundance as compared to the untreated group. In addition, serum levels of interleukin-1-alpha in all feeding groups were significantly greater than in the blank group, that is the control group. Of note, treatment with microplastics decreased the percentage of T helper 17 and Treg cells among CD4 cells 
no difference was observed between the blank and treatment groups with respect to the T-helper 17 t rag cell ratio. The small intestine, colon, and duodenum of mice fed high concentration microplastics showed obvious inflammation, higher TLR4, that is toll-like receptor 4, AP1, IPRF5 expression. Not bueno, guys. So we talk about leaky gut a lot. I specifically talk about leaky gut in the context of something like lectins, which I have discussed on previous podcasts, potentially triggering gut inflammation, probably by negatively affecting goblet cells, which make mucus. Refer back to previous podcasts on that topic. But here, microplastics are inflaming the gut of mice. Microplastics are going to be much, much higher in fish because fish are swimming in it, right? And shellfish. Yet another reason not to consume seafood. I know it's tragic, but knowledge is power. Yet another study, ecotoxicology and environmental safety from February, 2020, bioavailability and toxicity of microplastics to fish species. This is just talking that microplastics are pervasive in global waters. Ingestion of microplastics by fish widely occurs in the natural aquatic environments. Exposure to microplastics could cause various health problems to fish, the potential carriers of adult adherent contaminants to fish. And then what do you think happens when you eat those fish? Not a good thing. So one more source of microplastics is your salt. This is something that I thought about recently thinking, oh shit, is my salt full of microplastics? I'm using a sea salt. So mostly what I've used in the past is Maldon salt, which people believe is low in microplastics, though I have not found any formal testing of that. I have another salt that I'm using, it's Kalima salt. And they, uh, when they do microscopic analysis, they do not see any microplastics under the microscope with the visible eye. So, okay, that's reasonable. Here is an assay or a blog reporting North sea salt, Celtic sea salt, Sicilian, Mediterranean, Utah sea salt, which is Redmond sea salt, Redmond real salt, Himalayan rock salt, Hawaiian, Baja, Atlantic, and more Pacific sea salt. And you can see the minimum and maximum particles. The Pacific sea salt had the most 22 minimum to 51 maximum. The Utah sea salt, the inland Redmond actually was pretty darn good. So Redmond real salt is probably good in terms of microplastics. Himalayan rock salt was not good in terms of microplastics. Hawaiian sea salt looked pretty low. Um, also the Celtic sea salt, one of them was good. One of them, not so good. North sea salt, I don't know if it's the Baltic sea or what, uh, looks pretty good. Uh, like I said, I have a Kalima salt, which at least by visual analysis, I've seen the certificate analysis. They're saying that under a microscope, there are no microplastics in there. So think about the salt you're eating. Are there microplastics in the sea salt? Probably. It's probably impossible to find a salt with zero microplastics, but I think that going further down that rabbit hole and understanding where microplastics are and trying to limit them is a good thing, just like everything else we're doing, because they are prevalent in our environment. So in summary, I do not eat fish because of PFASs, those poly and parafluoroalkyl substances known to inhibit male reproductive enzymatic steroidogenic synthesis in vitro that's enough for me to make me really concerned about it. They're also present in the plastic line containers that we talked about. They're also present in dental floss and the waters. Avoid PFASs, heavy metals, lead, mercury, cadmium, arsenic. Essentially, all fish is contaminated. Lastly, microplastics, fish and shellfish, hugely contaminated. Significant evidence they cause gut inflammation and reproductive dysfunction in both male and female uh, mice, animal models, enough for me to say, all right, <laughs> that's enough for me. Fish are out. But Paul, you say, fish are delicious. I agree with you. Fish are good. I think steak is better. <laughs> Beef is way better. Ruminants, land animals are way better. But we're going to talk in this podcast about why I don't eat chicken and pork as land animals and why I favor ruminants, specifically beef, because it's the one I can get the most. So you say, Paul, what about my omega 3s? Can I get enough omega 3s without eating fish? Absolutely, you can we talk about this on a previous podcast. You can get plenty of omega 3, specifically EPA and DHA, are the ones you really want to focus on. And even ALA, alpha linolenic acid, can be converted into DHA easily when you don't have excess amounts of polyunsaturated fatty acid, that is, things like linoleic acid and seed oils in your diet. So, I did a previous podcast about that. I showed my fatty acid analysis. I don't take any fish oil. Fish oil is absolute bullshit in my opinion. You don't want that much EPA and DHA, it's oxidized. You should make 
Most of your EPA and DHA, you can get it from egg yolks. But as we'll talk about in the chicken and pork segment coming up, what are your chickens eating? Most chickens are eating seed oils. It's tragic, I know. Okay, basically we live on a toxic planet, guys, and I'm helping you or I'm sharing my ideas with how we all might navigate that in the least toxic way possible. So you don't need fish for omega-3s. I know there's a lot of people that promote four to six grams of fish oil. Bullshit, would love to debate them. No solid evidence for that. I think the benefits of omega-3s in trials predominantly come because they are imbalancing the omega-6s. And a lot of omega-6 problems could be related to the fact that omega-6 and omega-3 share the same synthetic pathways, the desaturase and elongase enzymes. And if you overload your body with omega-6s, specifically linoleic acid, the polyunsaturated omega-6, 18 carbon fat prevalent in seed oils, you will inhibit the production of omega-3s in your body. So is omega-3 beneficial or is omega-3 beneficial because so many people have so much omega-6 that it limits the synthesis of the omega-3s in their body? Most people, I believe, essentially everyone listening to this can get plenty of omega-3 from animal fat, butter, tallow, suet, ghee, even if you like it, occasional egg yolks, these are fine. EPA, DHA are in there, DPA is in there. And as I said, you can convert ALA, alpha linolenic acid, into docosahexaenoic acid just fine if you don't have lots of seed oils in your diet. If you do have lots of seed oils in your diet, then you may have a problem. This is a study from uh, 2012, docosahexaenoic acid, DHA synthesis from alpha linolenic acid is inhibited by diets high in polyunsaturated fatty acids. No surprise there, the conversion of plant-derived omega-3, alpha linolenic acid, they say it's plant-derived, but look, alpha linolenic acid also ends up in the fatty tissue of cows. To long chain, EPA and DHA can be increased by ALA-sufficient diets compared to ALA-deficient diets. Great. But it is possible to enhance the status of DHA in rats fed diets containing ALA as the only source of uh, omega-3 fatty acids, but only when the dietary level of PUFA is low less than 3% of energy. Yeah, that's a good metric in general. I would say all humans should have PUFA as less than 3% of energy. I've talked about that in the past. That's consistent with what we see in hunter-gatherer populations, the Hadza, the Ikung, et cetera. Less than 3% of their energy comes from PUFAs, specifically omega-6 PUFAs are what, inhibiting, or what are inhibiting the formation of omega-3s in your body. So yet another reason not to have seed oils. And as you'll see following up, yet another reason not to have chicken and pork fed seed oils because those animals are monogastric animals and they accumulate omega-6 in their fat and they will be essentially animal sources of vegetable oil if they are fed improperly. So that's fast forwarding. Stay tuned for that in one moment. Basically the take home here is that you can get plenty of omega-3 without fish and you'll avoid all the other toxins in the fish. What about iodine? You can get plenty of iodine. Egg yolks have iodine. Dairy has iodine. Muscle meat has iodine. And I think if you look carefully and the USDA databases, you'll see that there's probably an error there in how they've calculated the amount of iodine and muscle meat. I've never seen someone eating reasonable amounts of meat get iodine deficient unless they were doing something that significantly inhibited their iodine absorption and uptake at the level of the thyroid, like tons of broccoli, because we know that the isothiocyanates in that whole family, kale, collard, cabbage, chard, et cetera, the entire brassica family, those are going to inhibit the absorption of iodine at the level of thyroid. That's one of their main mechanisms of toxicity. So you get plenty of iodine when you don't eat highly defended vegetable plants. Imagine that. You don't need seafood for iodine either. I don't think seafood is magical at all. End of story. I would eliminate it from my diet. I have eliminated it from my diet. I would consider eliminating it from your diet. Look, it's up to you. You can eat it once a week if you want. Check your heavy metals. Understand your hormones. You better be sure what's your microplastic levels. I think that it's all about being the least toxic version of your human self that you can in 2022. And I think, like I said, I think beef and ruminants are better than seafood anyway. Yes, sushi is delicious, but did you know that the majority of the sushi that you're getting is farm raised in the first place? That may have less microplastics. Maybe it has less PFASs, I'd have to look, but you know it has more contaminants PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, all kinds of contaminants in farm-raised fish. So why would you eat farm-raised fish? The majority of the fish you are eating from sushi bars is farm-raised. I'm breaking your heart. You're welcome. Let's move on to talking about chicken. I think Pavel Sassoulin said it best on a podcast on Rogan where he said, chicken is a weak bird. I won't even try and do his accent. Imagine that you are a hunter-gatherer and you are in the jungle or the forest or the desert or the plains with your tribe. 
why would you hunt a small bird with not a lot of fat when you could hunt a bison or an elk or an impala or an eland as the Hadza prefer? I don't know why you would. There's no reason you wouldn't exactly. The answer is that you wouldn't do those things because calorically it makes no sense. You're not going to go hunting squirrels and rabbits and chickens unless you're freaking starving, in which case you'd get a little bit of fat. Believe me, you would eat every last bit of that animal, the organs, of course, but also all the fat because the fat is going to be very limited. Generally, we know that as animals get bigger, they have more fat on them. And so they're more valuable to humans who historically, anthropologically, will often look at large animals during certain times of the year and think of them as too lean and say there's no fat here. So fat is a key, key nutrient for humans and carbohydrates. We know that we can only get so many of our calories from protein as humans or before our uh, biochemistry doesn't work well because of the urea threshold in the liver. That's a subject for a, uh, a separate, that's a subject for a separate podcast. And I've done that in the past. If you guys are interested, I can do more on that in the future. Regardless, I do think that around one gram of protein per pound of gold body weight is a reasonable estimate for most people. When you eat that amount of protein from ruminants, you get an an array of amazing nutrients. And when you combine that with a few ounces of organs, either fresh or desiccated, like we make it hard in soil supplements, you do very well. Combine that with the least toxic plant foods, things like fruit, honey, raw dairy, you're freaking thriving. Tell me it ain't true. You know it is. But chicken, it's just not a good source of meat for humans. It's small, it's not fatty, and it's contaminated in many of the same ways. So think about this. Cows, sheep, lamb, etc. Bison, deer, impala, these are ruminants. They have cloven hoofs. They are grassland animals. They eat grass. That's their main food source. It's pretty easy to give them an evolutionarily consistent diet by feeding them grass throughout their whole life. Grass fed, grass finished is what you want. It's very hard to give a chicken an evolutionarily appropriate diet. Chickens and pigs are monogastric animals. Ruminants have a rumen. They have multiple stomachs. They have different biochemistry. Ruminants can saturate, which means remove double bonds from polyunsaturated fatty acids. Monogastric animals, chickens, pigs, and humans cannot do that. That means that we, along with our chicken and pork sort of cousin brethren, whatever you want to call them, are stuck with the polyunsaturated fats we eat. This is a reason that it's problematic for humans to eat lots of seed oils. It accumulates in your adipose tissue, your cell membranes, your mitochondrial membrane, all of your body, leading to problems through mechanisms I have detailed in previous podcasts. Now, go further down the rabbit hole. What are chickens fed? Corn and soy generally, they're fed diets that are much higher in linoleic acid than they would get in the wild. What does a wild chicken eat? Pretty sure they eat bugs and worms. They don't eat a lot of grains because there's not a lot of grains in the wild for them to eat. And I have a good friend, Anthony Gustin, who I went to Tanzania with last year to hunt and live with the Hadza, who is now raising chickens and pork on his farm outside of Austin, Texas. Anthony tells me that in his search for a chicken feed, he was flabbergasted. I just wanted to say flabbergasted. He was completely surprised and dismayed to find that all, A-L-L, all of the chicken feeds he could find contained seed oils. So there were no good, widely available chicken feeds. Okay, so what are the chickens that you are getting your meat from eating? They're probably not eating bugs and grubs. They're probably eating chicken feed. And if they are on a farm where they're not eating chicken feed, are they eating lots of corn and soy? It's very hard to find a really good chicken feed. I would say darn near impossible. Do you know any wild chickens? Are you eating wild? If you're hunting wild chickens or wild turkey, okay, fine, eat it. Uh, I recently got a wild turkey, a semi-wild turkey from Rome Ranch. They have them on the farm. I don't think they feed them as many grains. The turkeys are wild. They're allowed to range around and they eat mostly bugs. They do get some supplement with grains, but I had that when I was back in Austin and it was amazing. It was the best turkey I've had. That's probably the closest that I could get to a monogastric bird that is going to be evolutionarily consistent with his diet. Back in November, I went to Rome Ranch and harvested the turkey and was able to kill it myself and then clean it myself. It had been in the freezer when I was back in Austin. I ate it with the heart and soil tribe. But generally speaking, we don't do that. If you're hunting chickens or hunting turkeys, okay, great. That turkey's wild. Most chickens, most turkeys, most ducks, et cetera, insert your bird of choice here, are going to be fed corn and soy. They're going to be fed vegetable oils that is going to lead to enriched levels of polyunsaturated fatty acids in their fat. Not a good thing. So the fatty acid content in chicken thigh and breast as affected by dietary polyunsaturated fat level, this is an article, 
um, from these authors from 2004, the journal is Poultry Science. We find the coolest stuff. And you can see here that um, basically the takeaway is that if the chickens were fed more polyunsaturated fat, they had more polyunsaturated fat in their fat. No shit. <laughs> if they're fed more mono or saturated fat, then there was less polyunsaturated fat in their fat. And we can imagine that evolutionarily, chickens would have had much lower levels of linoleic acid in their fat. Now what we know is that chicken fat contains anywhere from 15 to 20% linoleic acid in the fat. If you listen to the previous podcast of Don with Tucker Goodrich, you'll know that for many people, chicken fat is perhaps the highest exposure of linoleic acid in their diet. I don't think humans want excess linoleic acid, whether it's coming from seed oils or chickens that are fed corn and soy. I don't eat chickens for this reason, especially fatty parts of chickens, unless I know exactly what they're eating and I've seen their fatty acid analysis, which basically means I don't eat chickens. doesn't make sense to me. The same thing can be true of eggs, modification of egg yolk fatty acid profiles by using different oil sources. The same thing. If you have more olive oil versus grapeseed versus canola versus soybean oil versus fish oil versus control, the fatty acids in an egg yolk will change. This is a huge reason that I am not a fan of chickens fed corn and soy to eat their muscle meat or to eat their eggs. So it's very hard actually to find chickens that are not fed this, which is one of the reasons that I don't eat a lot of chicken eggs in my diet right now. I do have some, but I have to work really hard. I have to search high and low to find places where they're not feeding their chickens corn and soy, and they're hopefully not feeding them regular chicken meal full of vegetable oils. So there's a lot to be said for this, but basically this is a study from Scientific Reports, which is a nature, it's from nature.com. You can enrich laying hens diet by feeding diets with different fatty acid composition and antioxidants. The takeaway here is that we know that what you feed a chicken changes the composition of the egg, changes the composition of the meat, changes the composition of the fat of that chicken, and it's going to make it either evolutionarily consistent or evolutionarily inconsistent. And I think that eating evolutionarily inconsistent food leads to massive problems for humans. So this is why I do not eat chicken. I just can't find good enough quality chicken. And why would I eat chicken when I can eat beef? I'm not afraid of red meat or any of these things. I appreciate the nutrients in liver and heart, uh, spleen, kidney, pancreas, brain, testicle from bulls and cows, from ruminants. I don't really want to eat chicken organs or chicken meat because it's just, it's a weak bird and it's going to have higher levels of linoleic acid than I want. It's going to be contaminated with all those things. Not to mention everything else that is going into garbage chicken feed. So if you can find really good chickens, eat them. They're not going to have defense chemicals, but in general, I don't because they're full of garbage. So let's move on to talk about pork. And yes, I'm going to tell you that your bacon is bullshit because guess what? Pigs are monogastric animals. Also, most pigs are fed corn and soy as well, which leads to massive enrichment of their fat with linoleic acid in the same way. Now, pigs are probably even a bigger problem than chickens because pigs are fattier than chickens. You may not be getting a lot of chicken fat, but if you're eating pork, you're getting a ton of pork fat. And my concern is that that is going to enrich your diet in linoleic acid. And enrich sounds like a good thing, but in this case, enrich is a bad thing. You don't want to diet this high in linoleic acid. If you have questions about that, I've done many podcasts on that in the past. Consider this study. Cholesterol, coconuts, and diet uh, in the Polynesian atolls, a natural experiment with uh, Pupu, Puka Puka and Tokelau Island studies. This is a very interesting one um, that we've talked about in the past, the Tokelau study. But basically what they show here is that these people, though they had a huge amount of saturated fat in their diet, did not have vascular disease. Vascular disease is uncommon in both populations. There's no evidence of a high saturated fat intake have a harmful effect in these populations. Further evidence that saturated fat is probably not a harmful thing for humans. But in this article, there's a little gem of a table that I will scroll down to show you, which actually looks at the fatty acid composition of lipids of pig and chicken fat from Tokelau, okay? Pork fat percentage, 18.2. That is linoleic acid. 2% of the pork fat was linoleic acid. 2.5% of chicken fat was linoleic acid in places where pigs and chickens 
eat quote unquote wild. And they're probably feeding these animals a lot of coconut because a lot of coconut is what grows on the island. A lot of coconut is what makes up their diet. So this is what potentially pig and chicken fat could be if they were fed an evolutionarily appropriate diet or something that was not full of seed oils. What is chicken fat? Like I said, 15 to 20% linoleic acid. What is pork fat? Again, 15 to 20 plus percent linoleic acid. Refer back to the podcast I did with Brad Marshall. If you have questions about that, Brad Marshall is raising uh, low linoleic acid pigs. I believe it's firebrand meats or something. Um, you can go back to the podcast with Brad Marshall. So here's another study. The effect of dietary mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids on the fatty acid composition of pig's adipose tissue. So what you'll see here is that the same things are true. The pigs that ate more polyunsaturated fatty acids had more polyunsaturated fatty acids in their fat. The pigs that had, pigs that had more saturated fat or more monounsaturated fat had lower PUFAs and higher mono and saturated fats because remember pigs are like chickens. They are monogastric animals. They store, they store what is present in their diets, in their fat, and they store it long-term. And that is what we consume as humans. So you can essentially bioaccumulate levels of linoleic acid if you are eating pigs and chickens fed evolutionarily in appropriate diets. That bacon you're eating, yeah, it's great. No defense chemicals, but that bacon fat is loaded with linoleic acid. I also talked about this in great detail in my podcast with Nina Teicholz. Title of that one was something like how pigs or how pork and chicken could be killing you. Look, you can get excess linoleic acid from pigs and chicken just like you can from seed oils. So I don't eat pork for this reason unless I know exactly what it's fed. If I could go to Tokelau, uh, the Polynesian Atolls, I might eat the pork there. I had a little bit of pork recently when I was on hunt and we ate a wild uh, pig that was killed by someone on the hunt, but I don't eat pigs that are fed corn and soy and seed oils because it accumulates in their fat. So this is why I don't eat fish, don't eat chicken, and I don't eat pork. What do I eat? I eat beef. If I could get bison, I would get it. I eat lamb sometimes, I eat ruminants. Ruminants are, I believe, the cleanest sources of food for humans on the planet. How do we scale it? Good question. This is something that I think we must not put the cart before the horse. Understand what is healthy for humans and how you and your family can become the most optimal versions of yourselves. And then we use our healthy, smart brains to figure out how to feed 7 billion people because we can't be feed 7 billion people anything good at all on the planet. So I don't think it's worth getting wrapped around that axle until we understand what is optimal for humans and then we figure out how to scale that. As I said in a previous podcast, we don't have a calorie problem on this planet. We have a nutrient problem. There are people who are nutrient starved. There are very few people on the planet who are calorie starved unless it is a geopolitical issue. There's enough calories for everyone on the planet. There's not enough nutrients for everyone on the planet. So we need to figure out how to scale better nutrient rich foods. People are mostly nutrient deficient, nutrient poor. As you heard in the podcast last week with John Venus, or two weeks ago with John Venus, vegan diets, plant-based diets, not appropriate for children, very nutrient poor. I've talked about that at length. I believe that beef and ruminants are the best food for humans. They're the cleanest. You will avoid PFASs for the most part, as long as you avoid the packaging and paper and cardboard and your coffee cup. You will avoid heavy metals for the most part. There's a small amount of heavy metals in the organs of animals, but I've even seen the analysis from white oak pastures. They took their organs, and they did an analysis of heavy metals, they're very low compared to seafood. So you'll avoid heavy metals. You can either get your organs fresh or desiccated like we make it hard in soil, and you'll avoid microplastics for the most part. Think about your salt, think about your water, think about the seafood. You can get plenty of omega-3 and iodine in the food you eat on an animal-based diet, which let's be honest, maybe I should call it beef, fruit, honey, raw dairy, and organs rather than meat. <laughs> But you guys understand that meat can be bison, it can be lamb, could even be chicken, fish, or pork if it's super high quality. I don't think much high quality fish exists. There may be some high quality chicken, but again, chicken and pigs have the same problems as humans in that we cannot move polyunsaturated fatty acids out of our tissues. They accumulate in those. You do not want to have seed oils, quote unquote, in your chicken and fish. 
excuse me, in your chicken. You do not want to have seed oils in your chicken and pig in your pork because excess linoleic acid will accumulate in them. Most of those are probably fed actual seed oils. Even if they're not, they will accumulate corn and soy from the feeds and you will get more linoleic acid in your diet. As you saw in the study that I showed and talked about, when there is less than 3% energy from omega-6s or specifically polyunsaturated fatty acids, probably a range of them in the human diet, then you can convert ALA, or at least in the animal models, ALA conversion can move to EPA and DHA. I think it's a good threshold for what is reasonable and evolutionarily appropriate for humans. You can get plenty of omega-3 if you don't have excess seed oils in your diet. Yet another reason not to have omega-6 seed oils in your diet. Look, fish, chicken, and pork, they're pretty much gone for us, guys. They're very hard. If you can find good sources, let me know. Send me a DM. If you let me know if you can find good sources, send me a DM on, in, DM on Instagram. You can email me for my newsletter. If you guys want to sign up for the newsletter, it's at carnivoremd.com. We've got a new website coming very soon. Stay tuned for that. But I send out a newsletter every week with what is going on with me. You guys know where to find the podcast, Fundamental Health. Share this with someone that you know that has uh, issues or has questions about this. You guys always ask me about chicken, fish, and pigs. And here is your answer. And I answered the fish oil thing. And I told you about PFASs. You're welcome. All right. Love you guys. Have a good week. Stay radical.